Wait, what? It it looks like a defense line on the map, but it's not. Uh, well, what is it then? <laughs> a ditch in the jungle. Wow. Um, well, what are you going to do then? Aha. Lose. February 27th, 1942. Both the Japanese and the Allies have pretty good-sized navies cruising around the South Seas. And this week, those navies clash and clash for real. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the big news was the fall of Singapore to the Japanese, and with it the realization for the Allies that the Japanese took 80,000 prisoners and caused another 50,000 casualties in the Malayan campaign for the loss of under 10,000 men. The Japanese invasion of the Dutch East Indies continued, and Japanese planes bombed Darwin, Australia in a raid somewhat similar to that on Pearl Harbor in December. Here's what follows. On the 23rd, American President Franklin Roosevelt makes a speech. Well, it's one of his fireside radio chats. We Americans have been compelled to yield ground, but we will regain it. We and the other United Nations are committed to the destruction of the militarism of Japan and Germany. We are daily increasing our strength. Soon, we and not our enemies will have the offensive. We, not they, will win the final battle. And we, not they, will make the final peace. A day earlier, however, he ordered General Douglas MacArthur to evacuate the Philippines and make for Australia. MacArthur has been planning on fighting to the finish with his troops, who have been under siege for two months. But by now, thanks to the American press, he's a major hero. And Roosevelt can't really sacrifice him politically. MacArthur doesn't want to leave and offers to resign his command and re-enlist as a volunteer. He's pretty stubborn about staying, having made a pledge to do so, and even as the month ends, is still in the Malinta tunnels at his post. Though I don't think you can fight City Hall forever. The Americans are making offensive moves this week. On the 23rd, six U.S. bombers hit Rabaul. This is the second American air raid on Japanese-held territory. The next day, the Carrier Enterprise and Task Force 16 shell installations on Wake Island. But the general situation... Now for the Allies, after the fall of Singapore, looks really bad. The Japanese have reached Sumatra and Bali, and they're advancing in Burma. There is exactly one Dutch division to defend Java's 800-kilometer northern coastline. ABDA Commander Archie Wavell sent a cable already last week to Britain with his conclusion. Loss of Java, though a severe blow from every point of view, would not be fatal. Efforts should not therefore be made to reinforce Java, which might compromise defense of Burma and Australia. Now, after the fall of Singapore, Australian Prime Minister John Curtin recalled the ships that are carrying the Australian 1st Division across the Indian Ocean. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill tries redirecting them to Rangoon, telling Curtin there is nothing else in the world that can fill the gap and save Burma. Curtin refuses, telling Churchill, We feel a primary obligation to save Australia, not only for itself, but to preserve it as a base for the development of the war with Japan. Considering Australia was bombed last week, he may have a point. But what exactly is going on in Burma? John Smith commands the 17th Indian Division there for the Allies. He had wanted to form a defense line along the Satang River, but Wavell ordered him forward towards the Thai border to slow the Japanese to give more time to make defenses at Rangoon. This was kind of a disaster, since one understrength division could not, in fact, defend all of southern Burma against the Japanese 15th Army. General Thomas Hutton, running Burma Command, had insisted on Smith making a stand on the Bilin River, which looks like a defensive line on the map, but in real life is just a ditch in the jungle. Last week, the Battle of Bilin River was the first major encounter between the two sides and the Japanese won. So Smith has finally been allowed to pull back towards the Setang River, but then has to cross the railway bridge over it. 
a real bottleneck for his troops. Also, en route there on the 21st, his troops are mistakenly attacked by both the RAF and the AVG, the Flying Tigers, which causes not only unfortunate casualties, but big delays. A truck gets stuck, and the whole crossing column is then stuck for hours, and by dawn the 22nd, most of the division is still east of the river. To make it worse, the Japanese come out of the jungle and divide and disperse them, though the bridge remains in Allied hands as night falls. Noel Hugh Jones, commanding those troops west of the bridge, has strict orders to not allow the bridge to fall into Japanese hands. His chief engineer doesn't think they can blow it in daytime if the Japanese hold the east bank, since the detonator is out in the open and would be under machine gun fire. So Hugh Jones has a choice between blowing the bridge and stranding over half of his force, or not blowing the bridge and giving the Japanese an easy, obstacle-free march to Rangoon. At 4.15 a.m. the 23rd, he asks Smith for permission to blow the bridge, and it is granted. The bridge is blown at 5.30 a.m. The Battle of Sitang Bridge is consequently called the Sitang Disaster by Smith. Many of those cutoff troops do escape, though. The Japanese do not really do mopping up operations here. They want to get to Rangoon as quickly as possible. So many head north and look for another crossing, even as soldiers of the 17th swim the river in broad daylight. Still, a muster on the 24th has but 3,484 of 8,000 men in the three brigades of the 17th Indian present. Japanese General Ieda, however, is not in a position to really exploit the situation for the moment. His troops are exhausted and have reached their logistical limits, and finding another crossing to the north is going to take time. The British have a respite, brief though it might be. Also, on the 21st, the 7th Armored Brigade, whom we've seen fight time and again in North Africa, arrives. They are well experienced and are the first unit the British have in Burma that is battle-hardened, has good firepower and good mobility, even if road-bound. Here's a side note about Japanese actions this week. Last week, the Japanese landed on Timor, part of which belongs to Portugal. This actually causes some real concern in the German high command, fearing that Japanese actions there could lead to the neutral Portuguese offering facilities on the Azores to the Allies, which could have disastrous consequences for the Atlantic U-boats. But while there were well, a bunch of fairly long diplomatic exchanges, it has led to no real impact on events, nor does the Australian force that is now holed up in Portuguese Timor. Well, it's mostly Australian with 150 or so Dutch soldiers. They have eluded the Japanese even as their main force surrenders this week. But a great many things do not elude the Japanese this week at sea. On the 27th, USS Langley, the first carrier the U.S. Navy ever had, though she has since been converted into a seaplane tender, is attacked by Japanese bombers, and after taking heavy damage, is scuttled to avoid falling into Japanese hands. This is just a small part of the naval action that happens that day. For that day, the Battle of the Java Sea begins, which is the largest naval battle since the Battle of Jutland in 1916. Dutch Admiral Carol Dorman's multinational squadron of cruisers and destroyers is out to intercept a Japanese invasion convoy bound for Java. His light cruiser De Ruyter is in the lead, British heavy cruiser Exeter and American heavy cruiser Houston behind, the Australian light cruiser Perth and Dutch light cruiser Java in the rear. Three British destroyers are to starboard, two Dutch and four American to port. They have no spotter planes. At 3.30 in the afternoon, the Japanese support group, a light cruiser and eight destroyers, is spotted by the British wing. Dorman doesn't know there are two other enemy forces nearby. The Japanese have in total two heavy cruisers, two light cruisers and 14 destroyers. And they also have spotter planes and can see all. The battle begins just before 4 p.m. The three Japanese squadrons swing into parallel courses where only a heavy cruiser's 8-inch guns can be effective. Dorman tries to close the range to use more guns, but when they close, the Japanese use torpedoes. These are the 24-inch lance torpedoes that the Allies have no real answer for. 
Exeter is hit and pulls out of the line on fire. But since she is responsible for relaying the flagship's orders, the line follows her, leaving De Ruyter alone. A Dutch destroyer is then blown in two. As Dorman gets the lines together, a British destroyer is knocked out and a Japanese one damaged. Darkness falls and the Japanese have disappeared. Dorman continues searching for the Japanese transports, but Rear Admiral Takeo Takagi's force is shadowing him. By night, parachutes drop flares to keep track of the Allied squadron. A British destroyer hits a mine and begins sinking, and the four American destroyers request to return to Surabaya since they're low on fuel. The Allies now have only one escort, the remaining Dutch destroyer, and they lose that too, since it goes to pick up survivors from the destroyer that was blown in two. Takagi then restarts the gunnery duel around 11 p.m. while his support group swings around to the flank. His ships have the advantage in 8-inch guns, night fighting, and torpedoes. As the range closes in the darkness, De Reuter and Java are both torpedoed. Dorman's final message before he goes down with his ship is for the remaining cruisers to leave without picking up survivors. Houston and Perth manage to go to refuel at Batavia, while Exeter limps into Surabaya to join the American destroyers. As darkness falls the 28th, tomorrow, the Allied ships will try to make their escapes. Houston and Perth have the bad luck of running right into the Japanese invasion fleet, and though they manage to make a mess of a few of the 50 transports, the Japanese fleet utterly obliterates them. The Dutch destroyer slips past that battle, but is spotted and sunk by two destroyers. Exeter meets its fate the morning of March 1st, trying to run the cruiser gauntlet after being spotted by Japanese patrol planes. Its two faithful destroyer escorts, one British and one American, follow her down. Three of the American destroyers manage to escape through the Bali Strait. This is not just the end of the Abda fleet, which has been literally destroyed, but the end of Abda Naval Command and the end of Abda. All of the major units of force on which Abda ultimately counted to repel the Japanese from the Southern Pacific and the approaches to Australia had ceased to exist. Already the 25th though, just two months after forming, Abda's command, that's Australian, British, Dutch, American Unified Command, is dissolved. Wavell is back in charge of the Indian theater. There is more general naval action this week at sea. Operation Neuland began last week. This is German and Italian submarines operating in the Caribbean to disrupt British petroleum and American aluminum shipping. The Caribbean is important because of the Panama Canal and the Venezuelan oil fields. And the oil refinery on Dutch Curaçao is the world's largest. This operation shows pretty good cooperation between the two Axis submarine fleets. And already after 10 days or so, they've sunk a bunch of ships from a variety of nations. Merchant shipping in the region will be temporarily halted even. Over the roughly five weeks of this operation, Italian and German subs will sink 45 cargo ships, the majority of them tankers, for the loss of one man killed, one man wounded, and one submarine damaged. Germans are still fighting on land as well over in the Soviet Union. Now, on the 26th, a Stavka directive to the Soviet Red Army forbids the slowing or halting in any way of the drive for Lyuban and Chodovo by the 2nd Shock and 59th Armies, respectively. In fact, it orders the Lyuban Chodovo railway taken by March the 1st. The day of the directive, 2nd Shock does manage to penetrate the German lines at Krasnaya Gorka. The hole is filled very quickly. As for the 100,000 Germans surrounded in the Demyansk pocket, on the 25th, Joseph Stalin expresses his dissatisfaction that it has not been eliminated and orders it closed within four or five days. That is unlikely to happen. In the Crimea, on the 23rd, the Luftwaffe flies over the Red Army lines, dropping leaflets that state that they know the Soviet offensive is to begin the 27th. On the morning of the 27th, it does. No one has been able to persuade Stalin's deputy Lev Mechlis to change the date. The 51st Army goes in, the German artillery fires, and the offensive comes to a halt. And here are some notes 
to bring this week to a halt. On the 22nd, Air Marshal Arthur Harris is appointed to head RAF Bomber Command. On the 25th, the internment of Japanese Americans in the Western U.S. begins. On the 27th, Operation Biting begins. Now, we cover that on our day-by-day Instagram coverage of the war, and we cover the previous ones on our War Against Humanity sub-series that comes out twice a month. So go and check those out. Links are in the description. And this week ends with a big Japanese success on land in Burma and another one in the Java Sea. Well, that could also be called an Allied failure. And it's a major one. They lost the entire fleet, literally sunk, and to an enemy that was roughly even in size, but superior in skill and weaponry. And that seems to be the common theme in all of the Japanese offensives in this whole giant theater of the war. But now it's not just in skill and weaponry. The Japanese are the undisputed masters of the South Seas. And just south from those seas lies Australia. John Curtin is very right to be worried. If you would like to learn more about warfare in that part of the world, you can take a look at our series on the Indonesian War of Independence over on our Time Ghost channel. You can see the first episode of that right here whenever it pops up. Our Time Ghost Army member of the week is Martin Hernandez. It's thanks to people like Martin that all of the content we create is possible. So please join the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. And do not forget to subscribe. And there's a bell, but I'll make a... That's my bell noise today, okay? So ring that bell. Ring ring that bell. Man, ooh, man. Oh, God. Can you hear it, Sparty? Can you hear it? Yeah? Woo. See you next time. (laughs) 